Hi, can you hear me? I'm Karen Kinnear, and I'm here to talk about nestmates um, in the context of when you ask for a small class file change, what does it really take? You've seen this before. So Brian asked me to present the nestmates as a, I only wanted a small class file change, and I just had to smile because Brian, of course, is the one who usually asks us, I want this language change, what would it take in the VM? And I, of course, I frequently say, you know, it's probably going to be a little more complicated than you think. Um, sorry, but. Um, so most people, when they're trying to think if something's possible, they think of, is there any path to make this possible? And we all do that. And once we've proven that there's a path, then we go into the, okay, what does it really take? And our job is to make sure that all paths work, right? Our goal is to, where possible, create a design that cleanly supports all paths and minimizes special cases. Because every time we add a special case, we get more bugs, more complexity, more security holes, right? So um, the boxes are an illustration of what the usual evolution is from idea to product. So you start with a problem, you have a proposal, you go through a design implement test iteration. There are a number of public artifacts, a JAP a spec change, in our case, JVMS, Java Virtual Machine Spec, um, design review, code review, compatibility and specification review, and then you release. Um, part of the goal of the presentation is to share with you some of the insights we gained from the challenges we faced when we were trying to add just a simple change, such as nestmates, and what it really took. Um, and I hope we and everyone else takes that away the next time we plan what a change would be. We're going to illustrate this with a nestmates project. Um, there are two parts to it. There's phase one, which is static nestmates, which is in the early access of Java SE 11 today. And I happen to think this is an ideal project to illustrate this with, because the people who worked on it did an outstanding job. And we like the bar they set, so just take this as this is what we would like to see going forward from all of us. Okay, specifically, the JVMS Nestmates owner was Dan Smith, and the RI Nestmates owner is David Holmes, who lives in Brisbane, Australia, so otherwise he would have been given this talk. I want to give credit to a number of people, um, Srikanth Adayapalam, Alex Buckley, Maurizio Simadomare, Mandy Chung, Remy Forax, without which whom we can't do anything, um, Brian Getz, Tobias Hartman, Dan Heidinga, Vladimir Ivanov, Vladimir Kazlov, John Rose, Sergei Spitzen, Kumar Srinivasan, and Bjorn Vardal. So it takes a village, and we are really grateful for everybody's help. Start with the first project, which is Static Nestmates. The problem. The problem we had was a mismatch between the Java Virtual Machine spec and the Java Language spec. We think we're all doing the same thing, but when there's a mismatch, there's friction, and we run into problems. So the Java Language spec basically has this concept of a top-level class, and the concept that when you have enclosing and enclosed classes, that you have access to private members defined within that top-level class. Well, when I first was looking this up in the Java Virtual Machine spec, and I did a thorough search, figuring I probably spelled it wrong, it knows nothing about top-level classes, right? The term isn't there. It doesn't actually know anything about enclosing enclosed classes other than this attribute that's not really paid much attention to. And the Java Virtual Machine access control rules know nothing about top-level classes or enclosing classes. So basically, reflection supports and method handles support inner and outer class special, special handling. The JVM doesn't, which means that Java and all other um, languages that use the JVM need workarounds. Workarounds are always a potential for complexity, special casing, and bugs. Here's an example. The um, orange code is the source code. The blue are the um, class spell artifacts or excerpts from. So we have an example of a nested class and a trampoline that Java C generates. So what you start with is class outer, and in the source it has a private member. In this case, we picked a method, um, m underscore outer priv. And inside the inner class, named inner, we try to access that, right? Um, it's a, well, that's dumb. Anyway, the 
class files, if you look at the top class file, it's an excerpt from outer that class. And what this is, is the, tr the st synthetic static accessor that Java C creates, which we call an access bridge or a trampoline, to allow you to get to M underscore outer priv. So it's called a you know, temporary name, access dollar zero zero zero, and inside it, it does an invoke special of what for it is a local private method. When you look at the class file generated for the inner class, outer dollar inner, you see that it calls invoke static of that synthetic static accessor. Okay, that looks good, it's easy, it works, right? One of the problems there, if you'll notice that the access on the synthetic static accessor is the default access, which is package private. So anybody in the package can get there. That's not really what we had in mind when we made this private. And as a workaround and as a trampoline, it generates bugs. So actually we discovered we had a class of problems. We just discussed the JVM checks, the not aligning with the language class rules, the need to tighten security, and frankly, we'd like to get rid of the trampolines. We would also like to improve access controls for dynamic languages. We have a future use case, which was mentioned yesterday, of sealed classes, which is basically the ability to restrict subclassing. In addition, unsafe to find anonymous class currently has no migration path to being a safe API, and we're trying to evolve all of our unsafe classes. So Brian and John figured out a potential general solution that could help with multiple problems, and the proposal for nestmates came about. So the model is to teach the JVM about a group of classes that trust each other. They have a closer relationship, and call that a nest. So a nest mate is an access control concept. So it's conceptually, nestmates are derived from the same source file or top level class. Nestmates can access all members defined in the nest, the author can control which classes get added to the nest, and we wanted the capability of classes being statically or dynamically added to the nest. So a JEP was born, JEP 181. Its current name is nest-based access control. Yes, you can even change your JEP names as your, uh, evolu of your design evolves. Key concept here is you have a class completely contained within a nest, completely contained within a package, completely contained in a module. And you may have heard John Rose's um, slides about containment at one of these talks. So we have a general proposal which can solve multiple problems, just a small matter of implementation. So this is what we expected the sequence to be, which I mentioned earlier. We now have the proposal, the problem, the proposal, the JEP, um, time to do a round of design implement test, and then we'll be ready for our end game reviews. Well, we learned a lot from our proof of concept, which was the first round of this, both exploring use cases and design challenges, and we ne learned enough that we needed another round. So proof of concept, I call this a prototype, just to distinguish it. Um, we ran into some problems there, and with some help from our friends from IBM, Dan Smith, David Holmes, and our crew designed an improvement which balanced a bunch of trade-offs and fit into some detailed constraints, which I will discuss with you. Once we had a prototype, we thought we were home free. In fact, we all thought we were home free. This wasn't just, you know, wave your hands design. We all thought we were home free. We'd worked through the design challenges. We just needed some more testing to ensure that all bases were covered. Here we were reminded that we have a highly optimized implementation. Okay, multiple highly optimized implementations with lots of code paths that are special case to make it as fast as possible. And we then had the exercise of making sure that all of those code paths worked um, and that we didn't break anything. So once again, kudos to the team for extremely careful test coverage. It, we did proof of concept, we did some prototype rounds. Those are supposed to be design implement test functions. Um, did production run. So back to where we started, just a small class file change, time to, we have our initial design, let's see what we come up with. So first goal, we talked about teaching the JVM about a group of classes with a greater trust relationship, called a nest. How did we do that? We use a pair of attributes, we ended up calling them nest host and nest members, the evolution of that was, you know, the usual, that isn't rocket science. 
We modified the access control rules for nest mates. That was pretty clear. And now, hey, we could just remove the package of private trampolines, right? That's all it takes. This audience doesn't need the diagram, but for anybody watching it on YouTube, the way that Java and other languages communicate to the JVM is through the class file. The things that we are going to mention here primarily are the attributes, the access flags, bytecodes, and the constant pool. So we do a draft JVMS. We put in some class file attributes. This slide is actually where we ended up, because you didn't need to see the details of, of sweating out you know, names and membership. The two attributes we added were nest host and nest members. So if I am a nest host, I have a nest member attribute that contains the list of nest members. And if I am a nest member, then I have an attribute that lists my nest host. If I have neither attribute, which is the state of all the class files, almost all the class files out there today, except the most latest ones, then I am a member of my own nest and I'm the only member. So. That seems fairly straightforward. Access controls, right? We needed class file attributes and access control rules. Up front, we did a number of design simplifications so that it would be easier and cleaner to make this work. So here's a few of the things we designed from the very beginning. Nest membership. Nest mates must be members of the same runtime package, which implies same runtime module, and share the same protection domain. A type can only belong to one nest. There's no nested nests. There's no transitivity. The access control rules, for, to make this clean and simple, we allow nest mates to access private members declared in the nest. You'll notice that because they're in the same runtime package and module, they've already got access to package, protected, and public members, right, declared in the nest. So those came for free because of the simplifying rules. Note that we do not allow nestmates access to protected members inherited by a nestmate that are inherited from another package. We made this clean and simple. This is about private access. We also, to simplify our prototyping and our implementation, because we're trying to migrate unsafe to find anonymous class, we don't mix unsafe to anonymous class and nestmates. Don't even go there. Um, so we have a clean design should reduce complexity, minimize corner cases. The access controls for Java SE 10 that we started out with, when you're doing access control for a field or a method or a constructor, you do two checks. You do a type check, and then you do a member check. And this is an extract of the Java virtual machine spec for a member check, and it's got a bullet for each of the access control flag options. You can have the public access, protected, um, default access, or private. I've only highlighted the bottom one. That's all we changed. So the before was if the, the um, member that you're trying to access is private and is declared in the same class as the requester, right? We're all familiar with that. So this is a picture of exactly the same thing. And the box that says if s equals, equals d for the private member is the only one we changed, OK? So the initial proof of concept change was if S and D, S being the requester, the caller in the case of a method, um, or the accessor in the case of a field, and the defining class of the type of the member belong to the same nest, then you can access a private member, right? That's real like, straightforward? OK. So this should accomplish our goals. Let's do an implement, let's do a proof of concept. This is one of the things that I, I mention frequently. Um, you know how people talk about when you do the, 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 the success path and then you do the error cases and there's that much more work? Well, when we evolve the language and the JVM class file and the APIs, we put a huge amount of our effort into the following three key things. Backward compatibility, forward migration, and future evolution. Okay, they all matter deeply, and we work very hard at our designs to keep these in mind. So backward compatibility is obviously compatibility at source and binary level, working transparently. And sometimes we get into the complexity of callers and clients and all that, but we make sure all the cases work. Um, in this particular case, we have an inner classes attribute, right, that already exists. We want to make sure that continues to work for reflection and method handles. Don't break anything. 
forward migration, specifically in this case, we want a migration path for unsafe to find anonymous class. And future evolution, we've mentioned a couple possible use cases like sealed classes and dynamic nestmates. So we'll discuss forward migration and future evolution in the second part of this talk, when we talk about futures, know that we've had them in mind in the design phase all the way through. So we did a proof of concept. I discussed with you the, the changes we made for class bell attributes and access controls. And now we have a JEP, a draft JVMS spec, and an early implementation. So I want to thank everyone here and everyone not physically here who contributed feedback. We've done all of this in, in the open. So this is Valhalla Dev at openjdk.java.net, and it's an open repository. And I want to thank people who sent us use cases, feedback, and you know, on, on both the design discussions and on the early prototypes. So we fed all that feedback, and, and thank you very much, and that's part of why we're here, right, is to ask for more feedback on the next phase um, into an improved detailed design, which I call prototype here. So there are four design areas, right? Class file attributes, we re-added nest host and nest members as we discussed, access controls, private access control rules, which we've simplified, then we have field access, that should just fall out, right? It should be covered by the access control changes and method invocation. So our proposal, our proof of concept, initial proposal, was to take invoke special, which already supports private method invocation, and evolve that. So where did the complexity come from? This is a look ahead, hint. We're gonna go through these one at a time. Class file attributes. Um, the challenges around class file attributes are the timing of things like when do you load the classes for the nest host and the nest members, and the timing of validation of nest members. So. The question is, when do we do this? In our proof of concept, we preloaded the nest host during class file parsing. So when you define a class and we parse the class, part of that process, we, we preload super types, your super class and your super interfaces. Right after that, we thought, okay, we'll preload your nest host because we depend on it. We thought that would be clean and simple. So then we explored more backward compatibility, not just source and binary, but usage model. And I want to shout out to Maurizio Sinla de Moray because I would never have thought of this. Um, today, an inner class runs even if the enclosing class is not in the jar file, not on the class path, cannot be found. That was one of those darn moments. I guess we need to change our design, okay? If you need to access from an enclosing class, the, the, from the inner class, the outer class, then you need to check if the outer class is there. But until that point, it doesn't have to be there. So we didn't want to change that rule. So if possible, we try not to break these things. So our goal is if Java C now adds a nest host and the nest host cannot be found, the inner class can do everything up until it needs to do, use a nest attribute for access controls. So that changed their design. In addition, I think somebody mentioned earlier, for fast startup, we try to minimize eager loading, right? Because anytime we require eager loading, you pay the cost at startup time or at class loading time. So what we did, the solution there was to move a nestmate test to be part of the access control checking. The class file attributes in the JVMS were modified. Dan Smith did a revision where it specifies, and I think it's in bold, um, that errors from loading and errors from validation occur during the access control process. Validation includes things like, remember the requirement that you have to be in the same package as your nest host, and things like making sure that you're actually in the nest member list. So we call that validation. Um, so all those things happen lazily. Okay, that wasn't too bad. Now we move to access controls. Well, we had just bumped our error handling into the access control time, so now we have to deal with exceptions. The first um, round of this, what do we do um, for access controls if it fails? The answer is return false, of course, right? You say, can I, can I access this? And the answer is no. Well, with the new exceptions, we mentioned loading a nest host can incur loading errors. 
Validation can incur class resolution errors or an incompatible class change error. In order to improve diagnosability, we decided we would throw the new exception because we really, really want people to be able to figure out what went wrong, especially because we're doing this under the covers, right? Java C has changed. It is now going to be generating these new attributes instead of your um, trampoline. And if something doesn't work, it's not because you changed your source. We want you to be able to see, ah, your nest host is not available. So the access control changes, um, which is the, the, the heart of, of nest mates, right? Basically were modified to be a little bit more than if you're in the same nest. It basically says, if you look at the bottom line here, if it's private, then the nest mate test failed and access control fails for the same reason. So that's the error handling. And the nestmate test is essentially get the host of the, of the requesting class, the caller or accessor, get the host of the access E class, and compare to see if the hosts are the same, right? If you share a nest host, you are in the same nest. That's definition, okay? This hasn't been bad. Now we get into field access. The theory was it would be covered by access controls. Well, for a change, the theory was right. We were thrilled. This is the only one that was, was basically straightforward from the design. Um, the alternate access, as I mentioned here, are an implementation detail. Um, I was gonna make you guess, but I'll just tell you what I think of as the alternate accessors. So if you look at this diagram, down the middle you have the bytecode path, right? Which is what we mostly think of in terms of accessing fields, methods, members. In addition, and there, they, that is our sweet spot, right? We work really, really hard to make sure that's highly optimized. In addition, we need to ensure that method handles, var handles, reflection, um, there's the uh, Java platform debug architecture, which includes the Java debug interface, the Java debug wire protocol, the JVMTI, and in our case, the thing we cared about in that box was class redefinition and retransformation. Make sure we still work in those cases. JNI and my favorites, unsafe and set accessible. So, in method invocation, we know that, well, frankly, if, if you've worked on method invocation, you know that it's challenging, right? So any changes to this are a challenge. And let me run through just a brief summary of how method invocation decides which method to invoke. And we take this very seriously because we figure if we pick the wrong method, it will be a surprise and people will be really upset. So we try to make sure that this is anally precise. So there's, there's two steps to method invocation. If you look in the box, you see that your caller is using an invoke bytecode on a reference class and method and passing in a, a receiver. Okay, so that's basically the information we get when you're doing an invocation. And there's two steps to, method res to met determining what method we're gonna use. The first one is method resolution, and the second is method selection. So the first thing you do with method resolution, you resolve the reference class, okay? And then you do a starting at that reference class, you search up the hierarchy, local superclass super interfaces to find the method that might have been inherited, okay? Once you find it, we'll call D the declaring class for that method, and you, do, you perform an access check. Can I access that method? Which obviously had the type check and the member check. Then we do method selection, and that starts with the dynamic receiver, and the selection does a similar lookup of the stack to find the actual method to invoke. So that's, that's what we do for you know, invoke, you know, all the invokes. So how should we invoke private methods? Well, when we were here last year, we had, were working on a proof of concept. Actually, we were working on the design before the proof of concept, and we were gonna use invoke special, which already knows how to handle private methods. We ran into some complexity there. So let me just put, mention that invoke special is a, is a series of special cases that are try to be tightly constrained, and when possible, don't touch it. So the verifier enforces instructions for many bytecodes, and specifically for all method invocation, we, inf in, we can only operate on a subtype, okay? So the 
receiver has to be a subtype of the reference class. You only inherit, until John brought that up earlier today, you, you inherit methods. Um, invoke special is special, and one of its areas is invocation of super methods, which allows non-virtual invocation. So we, f we ignore the receiver, we go directly to a method in a super class or a, an immediate super interface. In order to make that as safe as possible, we have some additional restrictions. So the two restrictions we have is we restrict the ability to non-virtually invoke superclass methods to be precisely on superclasses and or a direct super interface, and someday we will tighten that to be direct superclass. And we allow S to only operate on objects that are theirs. So in addition to the receiver as a subtype of the reference class, the receiver also has to be a subtype of the caller. The verifier enforces these restrictions. So take that situation where we have some nice constraints that the verifier is checking, and we want to add general nestmate invocation. Okay, so the ability to invoke a private method inside your nest for which we don't want those restrictions. We don't want that to have anything to do with superclasses. We don't want to restrict the receiver. In order for the verifier to do the checks it does today, it would have to determine, am I in the current superclass case, or the nestmate case, or you know the way implementation works, or both. In order to know whether you're in the nestmate case, it has to load the nest host. I think we talked earlier about let's not eagerly load the nest host. So we got ourselves into a bit of a tizzy and last year at the Language Summit, we had some ways we thought we would dance through this, and frankly, the solution here was to call a friend. So Bjorn Vardal and Dan Smith came up with the suggestion of, let's leave Invoke Special alone, and I wanna thank them for that, and let's evolve Invoke Virtual and Invoke Interface to support nests. So Invoke Virtual already supports invoking a private method, and we will allow invoke special to invoke a private method and to deal with nests only within the constraints it already obeys. So no changes to the verifier. So in order to do this, we updated um, the language, the JVM spec method selection, and Dan Smith picked an opportunity to clean it up, which we and make it more consistent because that really makes it easier over time so that invoke interface and invoke virtual now share method selection. And many people have thought they did the same thing all along, but those of us who are fixing the bugs in it know that that has not been the case. Um, if the resolved method is private, okay, we do a resolution step and then a, a selection step. If the resolved method is private, which has not looked at the receiver yet, that is the selected method. Done, finished, okay? So this works because private methods are not inherited, are not overridden, and do not override. We're done, okay? So that took that out of the, the selection step, and otherwise we do the normal selection lookup from the receiver, we do the same order of, of local superclass super interfaces, we check for overriding for inter invoke interface the same way invoke virtual is. This works because we got Interfaces can only have public and private methods, and we've already weeded out the private case, so we can always override a public method. Had we added protected or package private, which I hope we never do, there are a whole bunch of things that would break, but don't get me started. We also modified the preparation section, which is part of linking, which is a description of how we cache our selection tables. So it needs to follow the same rules as selection. There we go. So we've addressed the design challenges. All we need is production ready implementation. We have a working prototype, a set of tests. What did somebody say? What could go wrong, right? Okay, so additional things we needed to do. We needed to do some additional specification and Javadoc changes. So the language spec, because we're trying to keep them consistent, needed some minor changes to describe the virtual private method invocation and the, and the new lookup rules. That was minor. We talked about JVMTI and its related friends. The goal here is that we do not allow dynamic changing of access controls. Don't ever ask for it. 
we will never give. <laughs> anyway, most importantly, we do not reduce access dynamically. Okay, so we clarified restrictions on redefinition and retransformation. You may not change the nest host or nest member attributes. We put our foot, feet down. Method handles just needed some Javadoc clarifications, and obviously we have some new capabilities, so reflection exposes these through some new APIs. Get nest hosts, get nest members, and is nest made of. We needed to do a production level implementation. Did I mention we have a highly optimized implementation? Oh wait, that we have multiple highly optimized implementations? So access control needed to be changed in the JVM reflection and method handles, the method invocation. I did mention that was our hardest part, right? There's a byte codes, reflection, we have two implementations to make it faster, method handles. The byte code path itself, um, Hotspot has an interpreter, first run, then we have cached interpreter, yes, we even try to make the interpreter faster, C1, C2, Grawl. Um, I wanna do a shout out and thanks for platform owners, okay? Because every time we make changes to platform specific code, a number of people who we really appreciate jump in and make the changes on their platforms. So thank you for doing that. In the wider space, we've changed the class file. So we have class file readers and writers. First, there's a chicken and egg thing. For those of us who are doing the development, we need to not only generate correct class files, we need to create garbage class files. So the first thing we do is we start bugging anybody who has a tool um, whether it's ASM, whether it's the TCK tools, whether it's you know Method Builder or Java C, can you please give us something early so we're not patching hex? Um, or there's a open source, there's a there's a there's a public jelly that I use to patch class files, so I can test error cases, right, for things that are not validly created. So anyway, we do that. We get those as early as we can. Java C, Java P, JDEPS, the in-memory Java compiler, the test method builder, all needed to add the ability to read and write class files. We mentioned that Java C is the first use case of nestmates. It disabled the generation of trampolines for enclosing and enclosed classes for the private members. So that code is part of this change. Um, the JDK build tool to support Java C when you run with dash dash release 11 will need changing for 12 when you need to put that in there. Um, the TCK tools and PAC 200. And in the community, okay, many thanks to Remy Forax who um, got um, ASM changed early and who keeps working with us on other things. And I guess I heard just yesterday about other tools that have added nestmates. We hope that just adding two attributes made the class file part really easy for people. Test creation, I'll whip through this. Um, obviously, success cases, error cases, um, access controls, all the paths we talked about. Our favorite is the member access matrices. Um, I, I cut out half this slide to make it shorter and I won't walk you through it. The matrices are complex. There's a lot of special cases. You do know that Invoke Interface allows you to get, actually get to a, a, a method in object, really? Really, could we get rid of that? We'll use that, things like that. These are, these are all corner cases that we have to make sure. So in addition to the new cases, we added, we filled, David Holmes did a spectacular job to be blunt. He filled out some more test cases in our matrix of all, you know, all the mix and matches, right? The overlap of you're a super class and you're in my nest or you're not. So we have a much better range of tests and frankly, we had a couple of fixes we had to put in that we had missed, so it was a really good exercise. So finally, we were ready for the end game. We revised the JEP, final version of the JVMS was reviewed, held a design review, code reviews, CSR review, and static nestmates are part of Java SE 11. So if a year ago you had voted on which projects got in there first, I just wanna mention this one got in. So, Moving forward, where are we going? And we are at a point where we want feedback again. So that was the journey for Nestmates phase one. Now I wanna talk about the follow-on journey for futures. Here's the problems that we're currently looking at. We have the request for sealed classes. The original proposal is, is a class is final except for members of the nest. So you can only subclass it if you're in the nest. I heard a rumor while I was making these slides that that may evolve beyond just private. 
So I've got my own little private betting pool of how far that'll go. Keep, keep tuned. Um, we're, we're ready for it. Dynamic nest mates. Obviously, people writing other languages are dying to say, OK, but it's not in the nest member attribute. How can I add a nest mate dynamically, right? So we're working on that. We want to have some form of authorization of the ability to add a nest member dynamically, OK? Um, I almost took this last bullet out because I didn't necessarily want to touch on it, but, but John mentioned template classes and species and generic specialization. We may use this new nest trust boundary for species. Um, we hope to do that sooner rather than later. Forward migration of unsafe to find anonymous class. Can I just briefly ask how many of you use unsafe to find anonymous class? I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> Let's just say it's not our favorite API from, from an implementation standpoint. Um, would it be okay if we gave you a safe API? Would that, would that be a real problem? No, I'm, I'm kidding. So here, the challenges are it's unsafe, unsupported, and to be blunt, it's a little messy. Um, the capabilities that it's got today is the ability to find a non-findable class that can be unloaded independently of the class loader lifecycle the ability to have extra access to the host class, and the ability to augment a constant pool. So being eternal optimists, we think we have for this release just a small API change. We don't need a JVMS or class file change, and we're hoping that there's one of this design iterate, iterate test. Um, hopefully long before next year, we'll find out the answer to that. So um, these are being tracked via 8171335, and I actually need to add a few updates to it, which I meant to do this morning, but we will update that. Here's the first round of um, feedback, and thank you. This is all being evolved on the Valhalla dev alias, okay? So we have already gotten some feedback. Okay, another shout out to Remy. Um, please feel free to give us feedback. We are looking for that. It is easier for us to get the feedback at the design stage. That said, use cases all the way through are very helpful. Here's our proposal. Lookup define class evolution. So in Java SE 9, lookup to define class with a byte array with package access was added to allow dynamically defining a class in the same package as the lookup class. So that's a new thing in 9 if you haven't played with it. The lookup class defines the package, the module, the class loader, and the protection domain. You've heard this before. Yes, we designed these in parallel. The proposal is to extend lookup.defineClass, okay? Have an option to define a class which is dynamically in the nest of the lookup class. Option to define a class which cannot be found. So I, I'm making up these names, okay? Non-findable, I made up for the slides, okay? Because I couldn't find a better term that wasn't, didn't have other uses already. So know that that will change. The point is that these two options, nestmate and non-findable, are orthogonal. You can use one or the other or both. Um, and um, John Rose has a proposal for an alternative to constant pool patching. To get a dynamic nestmate, you would use lookup.define class with private mode, which allows defining a dynamic class in the nest of the lookup class. Okay? You can define a class into the nest because you have the lookup you are considered to have been granted permission to do this. There's an API suggestion that maybe this will be a Boolean or an enum. I don't do API design. That'll happen. We would need to extend the reflection APIs, right? We, there's a get nest host that would also return nest host for dynamic nest members. And we're exploring what get nest members would do. One proposal is that it would only return the static members so that you would get the same answer every time because a dynamic me member might come and go. Um, but that's it, right? We have built the foundation. We think this part is not so to rocket science to add to it. Non-findable classes. So note that lookup.define class would not require private mode to create a non-findable class. You could use any appropriate mode. Again, there's Boolean or enum or something for non-findable, whatever it's called. Key things is a non-findable class cannot be found via anything. This is the list I've identified so far. If you think of something else, I'll add it to the list. You can't get there. We won't let you. Class.forename, class loader.find class, bytecode resolution, 
um, loaded class cache, class redefinition transformation, class file load hook? No, cannot find. The point is that there's no guarantees you'll be able to find it, and because of that, we can unload it even when the class loader is still live. So you pay your cost and you get a benefit. So unsafe to find anonymous class migration. Well, we've just given you the building blocks. We believe if you use lookup.defineClass, you choose the non-findable option, which allows you to define a class that cannot be found and can be unloaded independently. Choose the nestmate option, which allows you the ability to get access to private members of the class. And if you need it, we'll tell you about a possible ability to augment the constant pool. We think that this will allow migration, and we'd love feedback on this, because it's a theory. Um, the goal is to deprecate unsafe to find an anonymous class when the replacement is added to give people time to migrate. Here's a alternative of constant pool patching. I think I mentioned this was John Rose's idea. Have lookup that define class accept exactly one additional parameter, which is an object, we'll call it class data. Preset a conceptually unnamed private static, this is like the spec, right? Every word matters in order, to the constant prior to class initialization, i.e., I, I can get at this, only able to be accessed via a lookup on the new class not, not the, the class that gave you permission, the new class. So a lookup.findClassData API. The model of usage here, and this is we're taking feedback from people on model of usage, is that you would acquire the class data inside the class initializer, extract the live con uh, constants, and use those to initialize static fields. So that's, that's a theory. Um, oh. One of my favorites, just note that set accessible and unsafe will not be able to write to these either, okay? Yeah, we hate set accessible and unsafe in the VM, sorry. Proposed details, just a couple. A non-findable class is valid as a nest host. An inner class is valid as a nest host. In fact, we need it for lambdas and string concatenation. Um, a proposal for non-findable class naming. So a non-findable class, the class file bytes would be required to come in with a fully qualified name for which the package has to match the package of the lookup class. The class name would be replaced with a unique name for diagnosability, which would be returned by a class that didn't name. Ha, huh. I have questions for you. Um, just a shout out, there's a workshop on Valhalla today. So Valhalla is, has We'll, workshop will cover value types, nest mates, and um, Condi, constant dynamic, if you have questions. We have a little bit of time now. But here's my questions for you. Um, first question, does this sound like it might be a vaguely um, migratable path for unsafe to find an anonymous class? Yeah? Oh, the, the final is really final? Yes. Oh, we like final is really final. Okay, thank you. Missed that. Did not actually know that we supported that. I'll have to check that in the code. Um, so then I should probably give you a chance. Um, I think we're out of time. But let me just quickly, is the non-findable class unique name generation too restrictive? Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, um, get nest members. Do we need two APIs? Do you want just the static nest members? Or do you also want the dynamic nest members without the guarantee that you'll get the same list next time you ask? Is it easier to have two separate ones so you know what you're getting? Let us know, send opinions. Anybody care? We have a couple, yeah? I see what you're saying, it's not a big deal. Okay, so answer us on the alias. 
Um, and will the class data meet your needs? Does that meet the needs you have for constant pull patching today? Yes. It meets Remy's, good. So think about that. We really, we really, really do want to know, right? Because we're going to go to a lot of work. Dane, does it? Oh, good question. How many people do constant pull patching? One, two, three. Paul. Okay. Um, well, I guess we have some test cases. Good thing we're learning to talk, huh? Oh. Oh, when is it going to be changed to use dynamic nest mates? Oh, we will deprecate unsafe to find anonymous class when we are ready to give the new API. Yes. When it's ready. <laughs> After we get feedback from y'all, really from you all, okay, that says we're doing the right thing. Because we can't ship it and then change it. Now it's a little easier to change some of this, but APIs aren't easy to change. We're stuck forever. And obviously class files are really hard to change. So we want the feedback before we ship it. So if you'd like to try an early version and give us feedback, we will, we will be doing this on Valhalla Dev. Oh, one more thing, if you're, I, that was a, thank you, Dane, that was exactly the question I should have asked. How many of you uh, use the constable patching? If you had the class data alternative, think about whether access from the class initializer is sufficient or whether you need access elsewhere, okay? So I think I would like to end this with inviting you to the workshop. I know it's the end of the day, and I know it's been two very exciting days, and you're, you know, but please come with questions on all topics, references. <laughs>